Hey folks, welcome to this tutorial on unit tests and the builder pattern. We are going to learn how to write validators and verifiers of our data classes and algorithms that can be used with the juice uh, unit test class and the unit test runner class. So if you'll bear with me, I've got my script over here to make sure I don't get off track and go on a bunch of tangents and whatnot. So before we get started, I want to give a shout out to Josh at the audio programmer for letting me be a guest presenter on his channel. If you like what you see in this tutorial, I have a modern C++ slash juice framework course linked in the description. You can study with me in a mentored one on one environment and really take your programming to the next level. All right, with that said, let's answer this question. Why do we want to write unit tests and validators? That's a good question. So we want to write these things because we want to make sure that some fixed input produces the same output when we are developing or revising our algorithms. Let's go through a simple example of that. Let's say we start writing an algorithm that spits out a pair of numbers on either side of whatever input we give it. And those numbers are one away from the input. So if we pass in a one input, oh, input, if we pass in an input of one, we expect to get back a zero and two, right? That's a really simple algorithm, okay? We can expect that for an input of one, we're always gonna get back a zero and a two, okay? Now, just imagine that as time progresses and our algorithm evolves, we start testing with other numbers, all right? We start testing with small inputs, really tiny fractions, really huge monster numbers, and we don't know anymore if when we pass in a one, uh, we're still gonna get back a zero or a two, okay? so we can add a unit test to the beginning of our uh, program that checks this. And if the unit test fails, then we know that we broke our algorithm and we need to fix it. All right. So let's talk about a real world example of this. Um, because this was, you know, pretty generic. Okay, let's check out a real world, real world example. All right, I will be using an inspiration from my own personal development hell right now, which is turning MIDI input into a playable guitar tabulature. So let me give you a quick look at how that is being used in my app, Cordy app. All right, here's my app, Cordy. So the way my algorithm works is it takes some MIDI input, which can either be from playing a regular MIDI keyboard like that, or clicking on these guys right here like that, or clicking on the notes, just directly like that. It takes in that MIDI information, it takes in the neck tuning, that's this part right here, takes in the number of frets, and it spits out a set of playable tab figures that gets displayed on the neck that you can cycle through. So let me show a little, let me show you a little example of this in action. So I'll just, I'll just uh, click on a triad right here. Let me just do this uh, like a second inversion triad and that sort of thing. So this triad, um, the notes of this triad exist in 42 possible configurations on the neck. They are all physically playable. All right. So this is basically what my algorithm does. It figures this stuff out. Okay, let me go back to the very beginning so we can see the default choice. Okay, so with that said, let me show you the algorithm in code form so you can see kind of how complex it is and why it's difficult to debug and why it's difficult to revise and why I need a unit test to make sure that with these simple inputs, I still produce output like this, but when I add really complicated inputs with like a bunch of strings and some weird tunings, like how I can change all the tuning and stuff here, when I add that stuff in there, I need to make sure that I still get these types of really simple outputs and that I haven't butchered my algorithm that produces these simple outputs, okay? So let's take a quick look at that. So that's over here in the fretboard job. So if I go to the run job, because this happens on a background thread, I've got all this counter stuff that's going on. I've got this do work function that gets called and in that do work function, I go through all of this, um, basically figure out all the possible ways you can play all these notes on the neck. I check if they, um, I check if they are, uh, if they can be turned into a, into a playable fingering. And then I check if the fingering is actually playable and whatnot. And if it is, then I add it to that set of choices. And if I go back over to here, I'll plug in a, a new voicing right here and you'll see, uh, You'll see it figures out for this set of input, um, this set of input right here, there are 216 possibles that it figured out and it was able to reduce it down to 37, okay? So it's not a simple algorithm. It's got some really complicated stuff and it's very easy to break. So that's the main reason that I need to have this. 
So an instance of that is like the make fingering function over here. It does a lot of stuff where it takes the notes as you're playing and it figures out where they are on the neck and if it's like within the range and whatnot, and or if you can borrow it with multiple notes and whatnot. It's a pretty good mind bender to try and figure out um, if it's doing the right thing or not. Okay, so for the purpose of this tutorial, I won't be using that algorithm directly and checking the results of that. It's just too complex for what we're trying to do. What I will do instead is write some dummy classes that approximate the behavior of that in a very simplified way, just to make this tutorial a lot easier to understand. So before we do that, let's go over some of the goals when we write a validator for a unit test that we want to achieve. All right, one goal when designing a validator object is to come up with a syntactic style of expressing the test that is easy to understand. As in, we're gonna have some validator object like that. Uh, it's gonna take some kind of input and it's gonna have a couple member functions and each of those member functions will check whether or not some algorithm that used the input produced an expected output value. As in, we could have like, maybe we just name that function has, and it's like, has some value like this. And then we wanna be able to chain a couple of them together like that. So we'll, you know, add a couple more like that, okay? That's an example of like, it's a really clear syntactic style, especially if we start uh, formatting it in a certain way, we can see, whoops. We can see that like we've got this input and we hope that our algorithm produces this value and that it has this other value. That's like a good example of um, a nice syntactic style. All right, so here's um, an example of what that will actually look like with the fretboard validator I'm gonna have. I'm gonna have a, a fretboard validator class. Uh, it's gonna take some form of a uh, MIDI input because that's what my algorithm needs. Or it's gonna, sorry, not input, it's, uh, the tuning of the neck is what it's going to need. It's going to need um, it's going to need the number of notes on the neck. It's going to need uh, the actual input that we're checking to see if it has maybe like 50 and 55. Those are two open strings on the regular E guitar tuning neck, right? And then it's going to have some member functions. Maybe we want it to know if it's got like a specific um, played fret, so to speak something that's like, we know we want the fourth string to have and to have like the open fret played. And then same thing for uh, the next one. Maybe we know we want the uh, third fret or the third string, the zeroth fret to actually be playing. Those are two examples of like, it's really obvious what we're looking for and what we expect it to have, okay? This is what's known as the builder pattern. So let's talk about where we have seen this builder pattern before if we've done some stuff with the Juice framework. Let me pull up these docs again. Now we have seen the builder pattern uh, used in the Juice in a couple places. Probably one of the earliest ones that you'll see when you're doing GUI work is in the rectangle class. So all of these ones, all of these functions down here that return a rectangle are instances of the builder pattern. Like if you say, I want a rectangle with, it's got this bottom Y position and it's got this particular center and it's got this height, that sort of thing. That's the builder pattern in action right there. Another instance of that is the point class. Uh, anytime you see a function that returns, um, uh, returns by reference or returns by copy, it's the same situation right here. Like this point transformed by some affine transform. So you could, you know, you could do a point that you're transforming via an affine transform rotation, followed by an affine transform translation, followed by, you know, something else. That's an instance of um, where you can kind of uh, sequence the affine transforms. Yeah, here's, here's a perfect instance. All of these are, um, yeah, they are all instances of the builder pattern where you can just chain a bunch of affine transforms back and forth, okay? If you've ever done anything with the flex item class, when you're working with Flexbox, that's an instance of uh, the builder pattern. All of these where if you said, um, here's my flex item, it's holding my component that holds a bunch of buttons. Um, I've got four of them in a row. Uh, I'm gonna do flex item dot with flex, then however much I want it to flex, and then say I wanna have it like a specific width, but you know, flex on the height, or I want it to always have like a specific margin. So I would do flex item dot with flex dot with margin, that sort of thing. And I have an example of that uh, here in Cordy. Let me pull that up. I search for flex item, flex item. There's a few of them getting used. 
Oh, okay, maybe over here in this thing. Yeah, here's a couple right here. Flex item dot with flex. Flex item dot with flex, that sort of thing. Flex item dot with flex. I'm not doing anything that involves like with the margin or whatever. Uh, mine are pretty simple. But those are all examples of the builder pattern. And then finally, the last place where we have seen the builder pattern. Um, if you've ever done any menus with the new member functions they added to the pop-up menu item class, these are also instances of um, the builder pattern. So you can define a, a, a menu item and you can specify it's if it's ticked, if it's enabled, and if it has an action, and if it has a custom component. And it's going to use the builder pattern to basically set all the attributes that are used on this. All right, so I have an example of that here. Set ticked, I think is what it is. Let's see, yeah, over here. So I've got a pop-up menu right here that um, you set the ID on it, and then you set the custom component for it, and then you set the action that happens when you click on that item. Let's see if I have another one. Uh, set custom component. I know that's used here. Let's see. Yeah, that's used in my tuner. So whenever I click on this thing, this one, I'm all I'm doing these not I'm not chaining these. I could be chaining these, but I needed to have a separator in my menu, so I just I decided not to. But this is another instance where I've got all these things that set um set this stuff using the builder pattern. That's over here. Um, calling all of these set enabled, set action, set custom component, set ID, like that. That's the menu when I right click on this and I see this stuff right here. Those are all the custom components that you see uh, right here to your menu choice right there. Okay, so we're getting a little bit off on a tangent. So this is what's known as the builder pattern and it's where you can chain member function calls and you can modify either the same instance of a class or a copy of that instance when you call those member functions. So for example, the rectangle class uses the copy approach. We already showed that. The pop-up menu item class modifies the same instance. Each of these functions returns a reference to this item right here, okay? This is all the uh, builder pattern stuff that's going on. So as I said, this is for the uh, fretboard feature right here. We're gonna create a validator that validates this input and we're gonna use it, we're gonna make our test use the builder pattern. So let's turn this stuff off for right now. And we can uh, uh, we can go look at um, some validator data types because that's the next thing we have to think about is what is our validator going to validate and does it have access to it? All right, so let's take a look at one of these data types that this validator is going to work with. Now, if you have never played guitar, let me give you a quick gist of how I am programmatically describing how the guitar neck works. So let's go over here, we're gonna go, um, let's see, we're gonna look at this. So each string on a guitar is tuned to a particular MIDI note. So if I right click on here, I can see that this low E string is tuned to MIDI note 40 right now. And if I were to play on the second fret right here, that's gonna be MIDI note 42 because it's you know 40, 41, 42, it's the second fret like that. Now I can express that played note uh, with an object like this, my played fret object, okay? This thing has two members in it right there. It's got one which indicates which string in my string, in my played strings array um, was being played. And then the other one is for the fret that was being played like that. If we pull this back up, if I've got this note turned on, my string num for this MIDI note 42 might be the zeroth index in my played strings array if I'm making the lowest string be the first element in that array. Or if I'm making the highest element be the first element, then for a regular six string fretboard, this low E might be the last element or index five, okay? So if we go back to our example of this thing right here, we can say that this with function right here is going to be past one of these played fret objects, okay? So that's the background for this particular use case as well as the data format that my use case is going to be interacting with, okay? So let's take a look real quick at how these unit tests actually work. We'll go back to our documentation, pull this up, unit test. All right, so we're looking at the documentation for the unit test class. The way these tests usually work is that you're gonna have some member function in your validator test that returns a Boolean. And the reason for that is because there's this void expect function right here, which wants a Boolean value passed into it, okay? 
Now you may accomplish this with a regular member function. If we look over here, we might have something, we might have a member function that's just like called is valid. And all it does is return true or false based on uh, some state here. Or we might use a user defined conversion function. And for this particular case, I'm going to go with the user defined conversion function. And that's because I want all of the member functions to return an instance of this validator so that I can continue to chain for a really long time. So the validators operator bool will return true or false accordingly whenever we pass an instance of this validator to this expect function, okay? So this is what this is gonna do is it's gonna let me construct and chain the test right inside the unit tests expect function, which uh, wants a Boolean. That's enough background for how the tests actually work. And if we needed to test something other than um, a Boolean, there's a couple, there's a few other member functions. There's the expect equals, like say we wanted it to check whether or not our lowest fret that was produced by the fretboard was two, that sort of thing, as opposed to, uh, if I turn this up, if I do that note, we can see that like the lowest fret here is two, but what if we were like, uh, we wanna make sure that we don't have any fretboards that are produced below this uh, fret number seven right there. You know, say we're replicating a capo or something. We could use this expect equals, you know, like expect lowest, the lowest fret that's produced should only be seven. And then we check whether or not that's actually the case, okay? All right, let's get started uh, writing this validator over here. I'm gonna be doing this at the bottom of the GUI class for my fretboard module. And um, just to keep the code really clean, I'm gonna write two macros for making a namespace to keep everything separate from my actual fretboard class. And also block Xcode from automatically indenting, which is and a super annoying thing that it does um, with uh, namespaces. And I don't wanna waste time running Clang format to uh, remove that, okay? So let me write those first. So we're gonna do it over here. We're gonna do define begin namespace, namespace n like that. And we'll do another one for ending it. All right, end name space. Just needs a closing curly brace like that. All right, now we can use it. Begin namespace unit test tutorial. And then we'll end namespace like that. All right, so this guy can go on right here. And now I'm gonna get um, all my code in here without it being indented and it's still gonna be part of this unit test tutorial namespace. So that's cool. All right, let's define the interface of our validator to begin with. So we'll do struct fretboard validator. Now we're gonna pass it the tuning and the played notes expressed as MIDI notes. For right now, I'm going to ignore the number of frets on the neck since this is just a simplified version of my actual use case. So let's add a constructor that does that. And we want st vector int t for tuning and then one more whoops, std vector int i for input, all right? So let's flush out this uh, with function and we'll give it a generic uh, mockup of this played fret thing. We'll just, we'll add one right here. Struct played fret and we'll just do int string equals negative one and then int fret equals negative one like that, okay? So now we can work on what our with function is gonna do. We know that it's gonna take a uh, play fret, so we'll just do void for right now. And we wanted to have one of these play fret things. Now returning void won't let us chain calls. So we need to return a fretboard validator. But before we do that, we need to think about how we want that conversion function to actually do the work. And it would be best if it just returned some yes or no state that we pre-computed as opposed to making it check something inside the conversion function directly. So something like this might work pretty well. Operator bool const, and then we we'll just return is valid. All right, then the issue becomes, where do we toggle this is valid? And as long as we have an instance of this fretboard validator properly constructed, we can call member functions on it without needing to explicitly give it a name. So that's what, we're, that's what we were doing here with this pseudocode, if we get rid of all this stuff, we can see that we've just got fretboard validator, some set of arguments, and then with, and then with like that. All right, so that's what we wanna do. So let's um, give it a private member variable. Bool is valid, and we'll just assume that it's true by default. All right, so now we can make our, um, we can make our with function change this if the uh, output produced by the algorithm does not have the played fret that we're looking for. So the first thing we'll do 
we've got our default value. The next thing we will do is we will return by reference to enable chaining. So change that fretboard validator. And now we can set up some logic for this guy. Give ourselves a little bit of room. So the first thing we'll do is let's, um, let's just do some kind of check. So if is valid and if it's valid and some, some check returns true, then we can just return our instance. Otherwise we need to issue a warning that it doesn't have that thing. Uh, maybe we'll add a J assert false um, and some kind of debug message to ourselves. And then we'll change this is valid flag accordingly. So we will do STDC out, whoops, played fret not found in solution, something like that. Let's give ourselves a J assert false. And then now let's flip the flag is valid equals false. And now we can uh, return this again, return this like that. All right, so let's add some members to store the uh, tuning um, and the input. So we'll just copy these guys directly and we'll just give it some names. Tuning input to to check. All right. So now that we have these th these uh now that we have this basically set up, let's configure this constructor. So let's initialize our members. So we will do tuning t and input to check i. Oh, and sneeze that colon after it. All right. Let's think about this verify function that we're. Uh, going to put together right here, this part right here. Let's think about this thing. So on a guitar neck, you can play a single set of notes in a few different places on the neck. Let me just turn on the B and the G like this. Okay. These two notes can be played like right there. It can be played this way. It can be played this way. It can be played that way. All of these are valid playable ways that you can play this G and this B at the same time on the neck. Okay, so that means for a given set of tuning and played inputs, there are going to be a few possible fretboards that encompass some or all of the notes that were passed in. And this is what my algorithm uh, produces. It computes those solutions as I'm calling them. I consider this pair of uh, this set of played frets to be one solution. I consider this set of played frets to be another solution. Same for right here. These are all different solutions um, for the input that was given to it. Okay, so I need this unit test to verify that the algorithm keeps producing that same set of solutions for the inputs that I know I should always have for a specific fingering. So another example of this would be uh, an E sus four chord. So there we go. Let me go back to the top choice. I'm on choice two, choice number one, okay. If I pass in this set of notes right here, the E, A, B, E, I should always get a correct E sus4 fretboard back with all four notes played at, at these specific positions on the neck, okay? And since this is always going to have multiple solutions, meaning that I don't have to play all of these notes right there for it to be considered a match, like this is just like a regular E power chord. All right, there's E and then the B. I'm leaving out the A. Okay, now the A is being played right there. Okay, that means that I need to check all of the solutions that are returned to make sure that the fret that I'm looking for actually exists. Okay, so this is starting to sound like an array of fretboard solutions is what's going to be returned from the algorithm. And that's what we're going to make next. I'm not going to bore you with the details of my actual algorithm or how I represent the fretboard internally in my program, but I will write some dummy class that kind of does the same thing for the purpose of this video. All right, so let's do that next. Let me turn this stuff off. All right, so let's um, put together a dummy class that kind of does what this, um, what this the main algorithm actually spits out. Let's define what a solution is. So we'll do using solution equals uh, std vector of played frets like that. And then we can say that we've got a, um, we've got a static function Let's see, we've got a static function that spits out a vector of these solutions. So that way, that's going to provide, um, if I pull this back up, play those notes, that's going to provide this set of uh, 47 choices, so to speak. All right, I'm not going to do that for the purpose of this video, but it's just to show that um, our solution set 
would be a vector of that. So we would do using solution set equals std vector of solution like that. And now we can do a static uh, solution set and then it's a make function and it's going to take uh, an input and a tuning. So we'll do tuning and then input tuning input like that. Now, as I said, this is just a dummy function for right now. I'm not going to have it actually produce that stuff. But let's just write what it's supposed to do anyway. Let's put it outside here. Uh, let's see fretboard solution set fretboard make. Oops. Yeah, give me the autocomplete. Now for this, uh, we'll just make it return a real boring E major chord in the standard E tuning. So for that, we'll just do, um, we'll do low string to high string in our array. So first let's provide the base vector that it's going to return. So return, here we've got our regular vector. And then inside of this, we've got this uh, vector of um, played frets that it's going to return. And let's define that. Okay, so let's make some played frets based on this thing right here, we can do played fret like this, we're going to have six of these, because it's a six string guitar. And the zeroth string, the first string, second string, third string, fourth string, fifth string, and a comma. And now we can say that for the zeroth string, we are assuming that zero is this low E right here. So that's going to be the zeroth fret, we can say that the B string is going to be the uh, second fret, we can say that the next note, the next E is going to be on the D string. So that's the second index in our string thing, in our string vector. Um, and it's going to be the second fret. Right. And then now for our G sharp, our G sharp is going to be in the first fret. And then for these other guys, it's they're just open strings like that. Okay, cool. So this is our uh, this is our dummy make function. This is, you know, we pass in some input and some tuning. And this is the result of that. It's just a single vector that we're dealing with. Okay, so that's our dummy make function. Right, let's do something uh, with the result of that. Let's store it because we're going to need some solutions to compare against inside this with function right here. Let's add a member variable right here, we can do fretboard solution set solutions like that. And now we can compute that here, solutions equals fretboard. And we can pass it our tuning and our input to check. All right. So now we've got this computed. And now we can uh, do the check right here. Let's start by calling that verifier function. We'll just add that here as like a little placeholder. You can say if it's valid, and verify like that, then we know we're cool. All right, so let's uh, flush out what this verify is going to do, bool verify, and it'll be the same, same thing we have here, passing in a plate fret. Like that. Now the easiest thing to do is just loop through the vector, and then loop through the internal vector and see if the plate fret that we're passing in this guy right here matches one of these. Okay, so we'll just do that. Let's go down here and add our verify function bool fretboard validator verify. And this we're just going to do for const auto fretboard, not fretboard, fretboard solutions. This we're going to do for const auto played fret fretboard. All right, if our played fret matches the PF that we're passing in, then we're good to go. But if we try to do that right now, if uh, PF equals played fret, we kill this and try to build it. Um, return true, return false, we'll get an error because um, this function doesn't exist yet. Yep, invalid operands to binary expression. So we need to declare an operated an overloaded operator uh, Boolean comparison in our played fret. Bool operator comparison const played fret other const like that. All right, we've got this declared, all we need to do is just implement it, which is super easy to do. Let's put that outside bool played fret operator comparison like that. And let's help ourselves by adding some debug information. Okay, so we'll do stdc out this. And we'll just say what this is string, oops, comma, fret brackets right there. All right, and close the curly brace off. And we'll copy this and do it for the other one. Other 
other.string, other.fret. All right, so now we get a little bit of information about what's being compared. And we can um, compare we can compare them and return the result. So return string equals other.string, whoops, and fret equals other.fret. All right, so now we can successfully compare this one or whichever one we create with these guys, okay? So now that we've got this, if we build it, that error will go away. Okay, great. All right, we've got our verifier in place, our validator class in place. So let's write a dummy unit test expect and try it out. All right, let's write a bool expect, bool expression. We'll do the same thing here, if expression, then we can do a stdc out, good to go, and return true. stdc out, failed test and uh, std and l like that and return false. All right, this could potentially return void, but now we can write a run test function. So void run test. Uh, I will put this run test inside of here as a public static. So that way we can call it from the main. So static run test like that. Oh, this should be void, sorry. Okay, void fretboard view run test. Yeah, that's the class fretboard view. Okay, cool. All right, so we can declare an instance of this fretboard validator and we can start using the with uh, function and we can um, see if all this stuff is cool. So let's do that right now. Let's just do a quick build, make sure that we don't have any weird errors going on. We should be good to go. We should be able to start writing this test. Cannot define a read declare because, uh, oh, this needs to be outside the namespace. Okay, there we go. All right, great. So unit test tutorial, fretboard validator, and we'll do one not as a temporary and then we'll do one as a temporary. So here's the named instance of our class, candidate, candidate. And let's see, what input did this need? This needed uh, tuning and then input. So we'll supply that. Let's see, we want our regular e-tuning uh, e for a regular e-guitar. So 40, 45, 50, 55, 59, 64. All right. And then our input is going to be uh, 50 and 55. That's going to be, let's see, E, D, G, and B. Oh, this should be 50. Okay, that's our input. All right, so now we can do uh, unit test tutorial expect, and we can do candidate dot with, and now we can define some plate frets dot with. We'll check for two. Oh, I have to provide this first. Okay, so let's see. Let's let's do it with two known good ones. We know that three and one is going to be a good one, so we'll provide that. Whoops, we'll just uh, do it that way, and then we'll do it again with. And let's do another one. Let's do two and two. All right, and we'll put these on separate lines so it's easy to look at. Let's uh, run this guy so we can. Um, see it in action. We'll go to, let's add a jassert false at the end, so that way it stops. Um, it pauses so we can make sure that the output we see here is cool. Uh, we'll do that in main, main.cpp, go up to my constructor. A lot of code, a lot of code right here. We'll do this right in the constructor. Let's just include this guy right here, include, um, that's not the folder, modules, fretboard view, fretboard view.h, so I can get to that static one. And we want fretboard view run test like that. Okay, let's go back to our fretboard view. Uh, where's that header file? Here we go. Okay, so if we had a breakpoint here, we'll see this get called and run. So we can step over this stuff. And I'm really doing this just to show what's going on. So here it has conduct, it's calling the with function. We can see it's going to step into all this stuff. It's going to go through all this. You can see if it's in there. Is it in there? It's not in there. Oh, you know what? I'm forgetting a, uh, a new line at the end of this thing. Let me add that and get this running again. STDC out, STD end L, end line. All right, one more time. All right, step on over, step on over that. We can see it compared to all these guys. Let's see it compare uh, two and two with the other ones. All right, that worked out. So now we can jump into the expect 
You can see here it's invoking that uh, Boolean conversion function. If we inspect here, we can see that is valid is still true. So if we step out, step in. We're in here, we can see that our expression is true. So it's gonna print this out. So step on over that. Step over that, good to go. Cool, all right. Let's write one more that um, doesn't use it as a temporary. So we can go back to uh, this thing that we had before where we just declared it right inside the expect function. We said we wanted to be able to do that. All right, so we'll kill that. We'll do one of these here. We'll just write uh, unit test tutorial expect. And now we can do unit test tutorial fretboard validator, same input. Right, and then on a new line we can do with, and we'll do it with another known good one. Uh, we'll do this one right here. We know that should be in there. And we'll do it with one that we know will not be there. We'll do, let's see, what, what choices do we have? We can do, we could do zero and one or four and one or four and 10 or something like that. Let's do four and one. So we know it's definitely not there. Let me extend this a little bit. And we'll run this one more time. Again, we know that this one obviously does not exist in the uh, input. And we'll just step over all this stuff. No, you don't have to do it with breakpoints. I can just click that and push play. And you can see that like, it did the right thing. It said, hey, uh, this one's not found, the one that they're looking for. Four and one, that's what they were looking for. It does not exist in this. If I wanted to, I could add some kind of like played fret uh, member function that actually prints out which fret is being tested. Because there's real no way to tell based on this which one is being tested other than just being like, oh, it must be the one on the left because that's the one that's being used all the time. All right, so we'll step over this uh, JS or false. Let's get out of here. Step out. There's our with function being called. All right, we'll step in again. That conversion function gets invoked. We step out of that. It returned false. If we step into the expect, we can see that the expression is false. Step over that. And we failed our test. STDC out, failed test. Okay, very cool. That's an example of, you know, writing a unit test that can validate some uh, algorithm that we have, okay? Now the next thing to do would be to actually convert this into an actual instance of the, uh, where's that unit test uh, class, unit test. The next thing to do would be to do that. We make a class that's derived from unit test and then we uh, make a static instance of it. And then we um, use the unit test runner to um, actually do the testing before we run our app. But that's you know more complicated than what needs to be done for this test because that's the instructions are right there in the documentation. This is more a um, this is more um, in, of a tutorial in how to actually go about writing the class that gets used in the unit test such that it has a builder pattern um, syntactic syntactic style. Okay, very cool. All right, cool. So you might be asking yourself at this point, how could this apply to actual plugin development? Well, just imagine that you have some function that spits out a waveform, and maybe you're doing a wave shaper or a compressor, and you know that with a given input function, you know, maybe a sine wave or something, and a given gain parameter, your algorithm should spit out a block of samples whose RMS value is always greater than uh, some dB level but it should never be above some other level, okay? Or if it was in the case of a limiter, you could say that the al um, the RMS level should always be um, below some threshold. It should never go above that. Now, that would be a fairly complicated verifier because you would want to pass it something that takes a lambda. You know, that would be your input function that produces the waveform block that produces the block of samples that becomes the waveform that you actually run through the validator. And then internally, you would need to perform your DSP computation and then compute the RMS, right? But you might find yourself doing this type of um, unit testing if you're in a situation where you're porting some Python DSP code to C++ and you need to make sure that your C++ DSP uh, performs the same as your Python DSP. Um, and an, an offline unit test approach like this would be uh, one approach you could use to make sure your DSP is being ported correctly, okay? So with that said, that wraps up this presentation on unit tests and the builder pattern. If you dug this tutorial and you want more of this type of um, instruction and whatnot, 
I have a Juice C++ course that I mentioned in the beginning. I teach it with this mentored one-on-one -on -one approach. So if you dug my in-depth explanations here, you're definitely gonna dig that course. You can check it out in the link in the description and you can start the seven day trial that um, goes with it. Thank you again so much for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to message me in the audio programmer discord. Or if you happen to uh, take the course, you can just message me in the Slack workspace. Um, you're gonna find me under the username mattcatmusic. All right, thank you again so much for watching and tuning in. I will see you in the next video. Deuces.